Hi guys, Dan here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Tower of the Swallow by Andrzej Sapkowski. Dane reads. So this is the fourth novel and the sixth book in the Witcher series, or at least in the uh, public in the reading order that I've been reading it through. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, the world has fallen into war. Ciri, the child of prophecy, is in hiding. Hunted by friends and foes alike, she joins a group of bandits in disguise and lives free for the first time in her life. But the net around her is closing. Geralt the Witcher and his allies are determined to rescue Ciri, while both sides of the war have sent brutal mercenaries to hunt her down. There is only one place left to run. The Tower of the Swallow is waiting. The Tower of the Swallow is the fourth Witcher novel after Baptism of Fire in Andrzej Sapkowski's epic series set in the Witcher world. So let's go through and check out some tabs. Don't mind the stains at the top, I accidentally dropped it in some ice cream. So I like these titles, these are given as like books that exist within this world and they're also published by the University of Oxenfurt, which I guess is a reference to Oxford. <laughs> this filthy sloven, this ragged orphan she drawled, is saying strange things. Must be a thief or bandit discovered in the bushes with a mushka. And yet you ought to know, Hermit, that I have read the history of Roderick de Novembre. I've looked through the Materia Medica several times. I know the Herbarius you have on your shelf. I also know what the Jules Cross Ermann Blazon on the spines of those books means. It means the book was published by the University of Oxenfurt. Don't know what I was doing. I was reading that as if it was French. That's that <laughs> the pronunciation. And we find that there is to be a, um, a what's it, a, uh, an amnesty. The word is out, the merchant said a moment later, that an amnesty will be proclaimed any day now. That even if a sentence is hanging over someone, why, even if the noose is hanging over them, it will be waived if they simply present themselves to the authorities and confess their guilt. That applies to you too. And we get bollocks, Kaylee cried, eyes watering a little because he had just inhaled a pinch of fist air. It's an ill-guardian trick or ruse. We old war horses won't be taken in like that. And this is because the Emperor is getting married, which is an important sort of aspect of the plot. We get a, we get a couple of references in this actually to uh, Winter Coming, which obviously just made me think of George R.R. R. Martin. And uh, this is told through the device of like Siri telling her story to this old hermit. And he says, at the pace we're going, this will take a thousand and one nights. And she says, we have time. But obviously I just thought that was a nice little reference to the thousand and one nights, which is the tale where uh, the guy cuts off the wife, cuts off his wife's head every night and gets a new wife and then one of them starts telling him a story she, and then she's like cliffhanger after cliffhanger. That was badly explained but you know what I mean. I thought this was cool, this was a nice little um, note on <laughs> I guess measurements in this world. From where we are now, how far is it to Sintra? How many miles? Plenty and it depends what kind of miles you count it in. Almost every nation has its own, so it's easy to make a mistake. It's more convenient using the method of all wandering merchants to calculate such distances and days. Reaching Sintra would take 25 to 30 days. And um, I like this little bit here, uh, Siri and Hotspur are talking, and they're talking about horse. And Siri says, does she have a name? No. Hotspur flashed his teeth. I treat my mounts functionally. I change them regularly and don't become attached to them. I think giving horses names is pretentious if one doesn't run a stable. Do you agree with me? Blackie the horse, Fido the dog, and Felix the cat. Pretentious. And Siri's looking at this guy and she thinks, oh, if only, if only he weren't so old, he's got to be at least 30. I'm 32. Mind you, I'm not trying to have sex with teenagers, despite what you may have read online. Joke, joke. Don't cancel me, don't cancel me. Siri basically, she ends up having sex with somebody, I think having sex with somebody who dies, like during the act or right afterwards. Uh, we get this reference. I never know how to pronounce his name because people say it differently. I'm gonna go with Dandelion, why not? Dandelion, you're asleep in the saddle. I'm not asleep, I'm thinking creatively. That was an entire scene as well. And uh, we get this bit which is very me. I don't like people looking over my shoulder while I'm writing. And like people do it, like clients do it all the time. Annoying, don't do it. Kaomar Diffin, son of Kaelak, Dandelion declared, pointing his pencil at the Nilf Guardian. I have reconciled myself with many things which I don't like, and actually can't stand in this honourable company. But not with everything. I can't bear it when people look over my shoulder when I'm writing, and I don't intend to put up with it. The Nilf Guardian moved away from the poet, and after a moment's thought, seized his saddle, sheepskin and blanket, and draped them over to Milva, who was dozing. I apologise, he said. Forgive my obtrusiveness, Dandelion. I glanced involuntary out of pure curiosity. I thought you were creating a map or drawing up some tallies. But he wasn't. Stop looking over his shoulder. Oh, I like this uh, discussion here, so. I know him, Geralt retorted. He can't be verse because he's not cursing, mumbling or counting the syllables on his fingers. He's writing in silence, so it must be prose. Prose? The vampire flashed his pointed fangs, which he usually tried not to do. A novel, perhaps, or an essay. A morality play? Damn it, Dandelion, don't torture us. Reveal what you are writing. My memoirs. Your what? 
From these notes, Dandelion displayed a tube stuffed with paper. Will arise the work of my life, my memoirs bearing the title 50 Years of Poetry. Nonsensical title, Kaya declared dryly. Poetry has no age. And if one concedes that it does, added the vampire, it is decidedly older than that. You don't understand. The title means that the author of the work has spent 50 years, no more and no less, in the service of Lady Poetry. In that case, it's even more nonsensical, said the Witcher. You aren't even 40 yet. Your writing ability was thrashed into you in the Temple Elementary School at the age of eight. Even if we allow that you were writing rhymes in school, you've not been serving Lady Poetry for longer than 30 years. But as I well know, for you've often told me about it, you only began seriously rhyming and composing melodies when you were 19, inspired by your love for Countess de Stahl. That makes it the 19th year of your service, Dandelion. So how did you come up with this titular 50 years? Is it meant to be some kind of metaphor? I, the bard said, puffing up, trace broad horizons with my thought. I describe the present, but I pass into the future. I intend to publish this mighty work in some 20 or 30 years, and then no one will be able to cast doubt on the titular reckoning. And they find out their way goes through the dank wilderness, which I just think, that's a great name, isn't it? The, grand, the dank wilderness. So uh, we get a psionic who is introduced as part of like court proceedings. She gets asked, profession, provider of diverse services. Is the witness jesting? May the witness be reminded that she stands before the Imperial Tribunal in a trial of high treason. We get this lovely little insight into um, what the state of spousal abuse is in this land. Uh, he did no more than what a normal fellow does to his wife on returning home from the tavern on Saturday evening. Just gave her a kicking, slapped her a few times and nothing more. Oh, well, as long as you did nothing more, Jesus. You get this bit here with that. Bonhart laughs, he says. You flatter yourself, I think. I must dispel those illusions. I'm undressing you, little idiot, to check you haven't concealed any magical talismans, charms, or amulets about your person, not to enjoy your wretched nakedness. And I believe, right, so we've got talismans, charms, or amulets. So charms bring luck, amulets ward off evil, and I can't remember what talismans do. But there is, like, specific differences between each of those 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 words and their uses. Someone gets described as as slow as a pregnant snail. Marvellous. We get a reference to the delirium tremens, which is like a really, really bad form of alcohol withdrawal. You start seeing shit and can die. So I want to read this little bit because I think with the Witcher books, it's the, generally the stuff about morality that interests me the most, you know? Know you, Master Witcher, the prefect continued after a pause, that I swore to myself that the law would rule on my turf. At any cost and using any methods, per face nefas. For the law is not jurisprudence, not a weighty tome full of articles, not philosophical treatises, not peevish nonsense about justice, not hackneyed platitudes about morality and ethics. The law means safe paths and highways. It means back streets one can walk along, even after sundown. It means inns and taverns one can leave to visit the privy, leaving one's purse on the table and one's wife beside it. The law is the sleep of people certain they'll be woken by the crowing of the rooster and not the crashing of burning roof timbers. And for those who break the law, the noose, the axe, the stake and the red hot iron, punishments which deter others, those that break the law should be caught and punished, using all available means and methods, eh, Witcher? Is the disapproval written on your countenance a reaction to the intention or the methods? The methods, I think. For it's easy to criticise methods, but we would all prefer to live in a safe world, wouldn't we? Go on, answer. There's nothing to say. Oh, I believe there is. Mr. Fulco, Geralt said calmly, the world you envision quite pleases me. Indeed, your expression suggests otherwise. The world you envision is made for a witcher. A witcher would never be short of work in it. Instead of codes, articles and peevish platitudes about justice, your idea creates lawlessness, anarchy, the license and self-serving of princelings and mandarins, the officiousness of careerists wanting to endear themselves to their superiors, the blind vindictiveness of fanatics, the cruelty of assassins, retribution and sadistic vengeance. Your vision is a world where people are afraid to venture out after dark, not for fear of cutthroats, but of the guardians of public order. For, after all, the results of all great crackdowns on miscreants is always that the miscreants enter the ranks of the guardians of public order en masse. Your vision is a world of bribery, blackmail and entrapment. A world of turning imperial evidence and false witnesses. A world of snoopers and coerced confessions. Informing and the fear of being informed upon. And inevitably the day will come in your world when the flesh of the wrong person will be torn with pincers. When an innocent person is hanged or impaled. And then it will be a world of crime. In short, he finished, a world where a witcher would be in his element. And uh, each of the different sections have like quotes and stuff that introduce them. And so this is from Anonymous Monstrum, or a description of a witcher. 
It is well known that when a witcher inflicts pain, suffering and death, he experiences absolute ecstasy and bliss such as a devout and normal man only experiences during sexual congress with his wedded spouse, Ibidem cum ejaculatio. This leads one to conclude that, also in this matter also, a witcher is a creature contrary to nature, an immoral and filthy degenerate, born of the blackest and most foul-smelling hell, since surely only a devil could derive bliss from suffering and pain. Or a masochist, I suppose. Great line here. Rumour has it, Angolem snapped, that your mother only charged her customers four shillings, but no one would give her more than two. Ooh, sick burn! I read that out to Susie while she was here. We get the line. They rode at a gallop, recklessly, vaughn through a tear. Uh, I think that means bellies to the ground. It's also the uh, official motto of, I want to say the Royal Marines. Here, I want to read this at the start of chapter seven. They're safe, assured the vampire, spurring on his mule, Dracul. All three of them, Milva, Dandelion, and of course Angolem, who drove us into the San Retor Valley just in time and told us everything, not stinting with her colourful expressions. I've never understood why the majority of human curses and insults refer to the erotic sphere. Sex is wonderful and associated with beauty, joy, and pleasure. How can the names of the sexual organs be used as a vulgar synonym for... Drop the subject, Regis, Jarrell interrupted. Oh, the Son Retour Valley, that means without return, the without return valley in French. And so I'm going to read this bit out because I think it's great. I want it, Avala continued, stopping and indicating with a hand, to survive. Even when we depart, when this whole continent and this whole world ends up under a mile thick layer of ice and snow, Tierna Bay Aren will endure. We shall leave this place, but one day we shall return, we owls. We are promised this by an Ethelinsbeth, the Ethelinaglia Prevenian prophecy. Do you really believe in it? In that prophecy, does your fatalism really run so deep? Everything, the elf looked not at him, but at the marble columns covered with reliefs as delicate as cobwebs, has been foreseen and prophesied. Your arrival on the continent, the war, the shedding of elven and human blood, the rise of your race, your decadence, the battle between the rulers of the north and the south, and the king of the south shall rise up against the kings of the north and overrun their lands like a flood. They will be crushed and their nations devastated, and so shall begin the extinction of the world. De do your recall Ithlin's text, Witcher? Spelling mistake there. That's really odd after all of those complicated names and they get something so basic wrong. Who is far shall die at once. Who is near shall fall from the sword. Who hides shall die of hunger. Who survives shall perish from the frost. For Ted Dered, the time of the end, the time of the sword and the battle axe, the time of the contempt, previous book title, the time of the white cold and the wolfish snowstorm shall come. Poetry. Do you prefer it less poetic? As a result of a change in the angle of the sun's rays, the margin of permafrost will shift significantly. Then the mountains will be crushed and pushed back southwards by the ice sliding from the north. Everything will be buried under snow, under a thick layer more than a mile deep, and it will become very, very cold. That reminds me of, um, I recently read uh, A Slip of the Keyboard by Terry Pratchett, and he used to work in the press office for a nuclear power plant, and he had a, a, a question come in from someone saying, uh, in the event of global ice age, will the nuclear power plant be okay? And he, his reply was like, no, because it will be under a mile of ice. Nothing will be okay. <laughs> I like this bit of dialogue. Do you know, Witcher, what the greatest snag of longevity is? No. Sex. What? You heard, right? Sex. After almost a hundred years, it becomes boring. There's nothing in it to fascinate or excite any longer. Nothing that has the exciting appeal of novelty. It has all been done already, in this or that way, but it has happened. And then suddenly comes the conjunction of the spheres and you people appear here. Human survivors come from another world, from your former world, which you managed utterly to destroy with your still her suit hands, barely five million years after revolving as a species. There's only a handful of you. Your life expectancy is ridiculously low, so your survival depends on the pace of reproduction. Thus unbridled lust never leaves you. Sex totally governs you. It's a drive more powerful even than a survival instinct. To die? Why not if one can fuck around beforehand? That is your entire philosophy. I think you'll find that our entire philosophy is Hey, 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 smoke weed every day. I like this, I think this is a great line. Perhaps I'll find a remedy for that. And do you know, Siri, what university studies give a person? No, what? The ability to make use of sources. Yeah, APA formatting. Still don't know how to do that. And uh, this is a great little illustration of the different like calendars and time systems. The day after tomorrow, thought Vizogota, is the feast of Samhain. According to the Alvin calendar, it'll be the new year in three days. According to the human calendar, we'll have to wait another two months. 
Well, Samhain is uh, Halloween, right? Presumably the humans in this world also use the Gregorian calendar. So yeah, that's about all I have to share with you guys from uh, The Tower of the Swallow by Andrzej Spikowski. Overall, I did enjoy it. I feel as though the, the uh, plot slowed down a little bit here after picking up in the last book, which is kind of a shame. I think uh, uh, The Baptism of Fire has been my favorite so far. But this was still a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5, and I'm still very happy with it. Still plan to continue the series. Only two more books to go. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Tower of the Swallow by Andrzej Spikowski. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.